Today's walk is a little bit more straightforward than what we saw in part 6, but we'll still be taking a few detours along the way, as you can see on the map there. We'll be staying mostly here in Isezaki-cho, covering Ichome to Yonchome, but we'll be taking a few detours over to Chojamachi, Suehiro-cho, and Wakaba-cho as we take a look at a few different things. Some of the buildings here, like, I don't know about this one, but I know this one here belongs to a set of buildings that I believe date back as far as the 1920s when this area really started to become the, the big shopping street it would be, even though it has suffered some setbacks over the years. We'll finally be able to take a walk down here. We've been talking about it for a few months now as we've been doing all the other parts, but this is the first time we've really been able to start heading down the street. And the Isezaki Mall area we're in right now, this does stretch from Isezaki Cho Ichome to Nichome. It's classified as a Hokol Sha Tengoku or pedestrian paradise. There's no cars, there's no car traffic going through these streets. There shouldn't be any bike traffic either, but you will see a lot of people cutting through here on bikes that probably shouldn't be doing that. The game footage will end up going in and out as we're walking down here, sometimes for some longer stretches of time as we'll outpace the in-game footage. You can see the red awning over here, the Yurindo Bookstore. That dates back to prior to 1956, but the way it is now, when the area rebuilt after the US occupation, that's been there for quite a while. I think that's their flagship store. Plage there in-game. I didn't find anything like that, unfortunately. At least not in real life. And there's Yurindo, or the Yokodo Bookstore in-game that you can buy in the business management minigame in Yakuza Like a Dragon. Right here, this is the Weta Kitchen location for Ijin Cho in-game. This is the Kaitori Kaozo, which is a pawn shop and thrift shop here in real life. They're very different types of buildings, but it's pretty rad that they have cool dinosaurs on the, the facade there. We're back here and we'll head past some of this stuff and we'll take a look at a couple of things. Yep, there's the bicycle guy right there. We'll be coming up on a section here. We'll cut away to full screen in just a moment. There is in-game a uh, place you can eat at, Yoronotaki. That does exist. It's a real chain in, in real life, but there isn't a location here in Isezaki-cho. You'd have to go over to Nogecho or Ishikawa-cho. Both areas not too far away. You'll be able to find some locations there. As you can see, there's no in-game footage here. We won't run into anything... Super similar along the street here for a little bit. Although if you see this blue Hamaya, we'll take a left-hand turn here and head down this alleyway. It is a little bit similar. There's another alleyway we'll be taking a look at in a minute as we go further south. I stopped at this sign here though, mainly due to, I was like, why is Bill Clinton on this sign? It's clearly not Bill Clinton, but it was a little bit weird and funny to see, why not? We'll head down over to here, and this will lead us into the subject of something that I haven't brought up yet. With the last episode we touched upon, Red Light District, I was going to do a separate episode to cover Red Light District as well as Restaurant Row, but I decided to integrate those into the main episodes. Do a quick pan around here, but since we already covered Red Light District, we're going to go ahead and talk about Restaurant Row a little bit. For those that are not familiar with the series too much, Restaurant Row is the area that houses the Yokohama Lyuman Triad Gang. It's kind of a grimy pseudo Chinatown, considered the real Chinatown, if you want to put that in air quotes, as opposed to the other Chinatown that we've seen so far in game where it's considered like the kind of touristy fake area. It's the fake Chinatown. Throughout all the research that I've done in the series so far beforehand, as well as all the stuff I've done since then. This is the one spot that I never quite figured out. We're going to take a look at some of the walking path here. As we're starting back at Yokohama Cinemarine, we'll be seeing that in the main walk here in a little bit. We're heading north here. We'll go out of Chojamachi, where Cinemarine is at, and we'll cross into Suehirocho as we're heading back north. Going through here, none of it absolutely none of it resembled what you see in game where it's it looks like a Chinatown but just something a little bit more run down 
You'll see some restaurants around here, but a lot of this stuff seems to have been around for a while. There's, of course, construction going on. But yeah, this is the one area that 100% I just, I didn't have a clue on. I think one person may have told me that they kind of sort of knew where it was at, but they didn't end up giving me much information from there and I didn't follow up on it, so that's my fault. So I'm really only showing you what I have that kind of matches the amount of time that it takes for Yagami to go from the south end of the street there in Restaurant Row all the way up to the north end. So I'm kind of calling upon those that are watching this either when it comes out or in the future. If you have any leads on a real life equivalent to Restaurant Row, please leave a comment down below. I'd love to hear from you on that and to have some extra leads on it because it it's still a bit of a mystery and I hate to leave it as an open-ended like, I don't know what it is, but unfortunately that's just kind of how it's going to have to stay or at least right now. Maybe it's something I can come back to here in the near future or somewhere in the future and we'll have a better idea of what it is. But for the moment, this is all I really have to say about the subject. We're back where we started out at, at that Hamaya cigarette booth. Picking back up. It's a Uniqlo off to the side. There's actually a nice book off bookstore over here that was especially helpful. There's not a whole lot going on here at the moment, so we can have our prerequisite history lesson. Isezaki Cho dates back to before 1671, but at that point in time, it was just, it was farmland. There was nothing else here. By 1889, that was when things had become modernized as really the entire area and Yokohama itself became more and more important to incoming international trade and everything in Japan was starting to modernize. This area had, I think, some red light district adjacent stuff, but it was becoming well known around that time for sumo and for theaters. Although, there is something to see here. There is the gate. As we zoom in, there's the gate for Fukutomicho. You can directly access it. That's where we were in part 5. Go back and check that episode if you haven't seen it. But yeah, as it was modernizing, you had normal theaters like for stage plays and whatnot at that point in time. This area did become well known for movie theaters. We'll cover that in a little bit as we get a little further down the road. But Isezaki Cho itself, like everything else in the area, was affected by the Great Kanto Earthquake. And then when World War II broke out, a lot of it was destroyed and really didn't rebuild until the U.S. occupation forces had left in the early 1950s. And at that point, everything really started to improve and get rebuilt again. Now, as we come up over here, you'll we'll see off to the right-hand side, there's a detour. If you're not familiar with that, it's a big coffee chain, and that is represented in-game by the Pocket Cafe. We'll take a quick look here. I didn't get to shoot a whole lot because it was extremely busy. Every time I went by it or went into it, it was a pretty busy place. But aside from some very minor differences, it's clear that Pocket Cafe in game was meant to represent the tour here. Yeah, all I got was some toast and some coffee, but it wasn't too bad and it's relatively cheap. Clearly why it's very popular. We're going to detour just over here. This is something we saw back in part five as well. This alleyway in game, as well as here in real life, although it is separated a bit by like a small one way street being down here. We looked at Hotel Funnies in part five. So if you want to get a better look at that building, I recommend going back over and looking at that. But I wanted to include it here because Hotel Funnies actually is part of Isezaki Cho, even though we covered it in Fukutomi Cho. But since there's the alleyway, I wanted to take at least a quick look at it. And you can see in game, it's just a parking lot and some maybe not old buildings, but the unfinished side of buildings that nobody really ends up seeing. It's about here that the footage I used in part five starts up. And yeah, not a very important detour, but just something I wanted to point out. We start heading down this way. We won't have a whole lot of footage to take a look at in game. Not until we get past here. It's right around this point, actually, the building that's going to be just across the street with that kind of rounded exterior and the glass windows. That's kind of where I thought at first, I was like, oh, hey, maybe this is where Welcome Pharmacy's at. But we can see that already ahead. You can see the very large Don Quixote. We'll get up to about there when the game footage comes back in. And we'll take a, a turn down towards something that will be taking a look at from there that I already mentioned, the Cinemarine Theater. I think I ate at that Matsuya, which is a franchise we've seen in the series. 
you need a cheap meal, it's a very easy place to go to. All ordering is done through vending machines and it is translated into English as well as multiple other Asian languages. I think, I think Chinese and Korean. I don't remember which Chinese dialect. It might be simplified Chinese. So if you speak Mandarin, it'd be easy enough to order there. But good, cheap lunches. Can't beat it, man. It probably became my favorite beef bowl place to go to. And we're finally catching back up. And when we get up to the warning signs there for the bike traffic, we're seeing a few things that match a little bit more. It's a little bit off center though, you can see in game. It's not a straight ahead street. You'd have to take a little left turn there and then cross the street and you would be able to go further down through Isezaki Road. There's the Don Quixote. I'm wondering if in game they might have still planned it to be that and once they lost the license, they decided, okay, well, we can turn it into something else. But you can see they still use the building as the basis for Welcome Pharmacy there. We're heading off to the east here to take a look at a spot that I was very pleased to find out existed. And it's very well represented here in game. It's not the 7-Eleven, although that'd be a heck of a score for them if they actually got 7-Eleven branding in game. I imagine that can't be cheap though but maybe one day. Atsuma, this uh, Kisa, it's Kisa Ten coffee shop. I didn't get the chance to go in there, but it's apparently pretty old school. And there is kind of an equivalent building there on the corner in game. We'll cut back over here and look at Yokohama Cinemarine. It's represented in game here by Seagull Cinema. It's where the mini game is played for Ichiban and his friends to go see movies and Try not to fall asleep. The building that Cinemarine occupies has been here since 1955. It's gone through a couple owners, but it's been Cinemarine since 1989 and closed down kind of briefly in 2014 before it had new owners and got a bit of a facelift in its lobby that was completed in 2015. And this is a spot that I didn't film a whole lot in since it's a movie theater. You really don't want to be filming around within the lobby because it's pretty small and there's going to be people waiting for any of the showings to start because I believe it's only a single screen theater. I only just saw the single screen. Clearly you don't want to be pointing a camera around of any type inside of there. This is from just outside the lobby. There's a bunch of flyers and other things you can take a look at. Thankfully, through the magic of Google Street View, they do have an entire walkthrough that you can take a look at. It's a bit old, but I don't detect a whole lot of differences compared to what I was seeing while I was there. I did end up seeing a movie. I saw Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence for the first time, a film with David Bowie and Ryuichi Sakamoto. And even for the size and the age, it still feels pretty modern. They've upgraded the screening technology and the screen itself. You're not gonna get your full multiplex style seating that you'd expect out of a major theater, but you still get a pretty good movie going experience out of it. And it's pretty cheap too. However, as I was putting all this together, there wasn't another spot that I was kind of aware of already down in nearby Wakabacho. And that's a spot called Cinema Jack and Betty. And I would argue that this spot here probably forms the biggest basis of the interior of Seagull Cinema. Also that sign, look at that, it's great, isn't it? What a good sign. I love it. And the interior here looks a lot closer to what we see. This place dates back to 1952 and it's operated under the Jack and Betty name since 1991. It's gone under a couple of different owners, but it's managed to manage to stay open even as all the other theaters in the area have started to close. But you can even see with the, the concession stand there, some of the hallways. You'll see also with the screening rooms too. I feel like this is much, much closer to what we see in Seagull Cinema than what we ended up seeing over at Cinemarine for the interiors. Like they pulled the Cinemarine exteriors and with it being underground kind of in a basement level and being a single screen theater, they use that as their basis for how it would look. But yeah, once we're inside here, we can take a look and it looks a lot closer. This used to be split up. The screening rooms would show either Western films or Japanese films, but it looks like they show a mixture of independent films and documentaries now. Same as Cinemarine, but it's nice to have a lot of these older movie houses still in existence in this area. We'll pick back up here at the crosswalk near the Don Quixote. 
crossing over into Isezaki Cho Sanchome. There's a pretty big Don Quixote as well there. There's a giant fish tank, I think, right outside, and the entrances are quite large. But I did prefer the Mega Don Quixote over in Yamate, not too far away. It's a little bit easier to shop at. We're getting near the end of Isezaki Road in game. We'll pass by the, I think it's called Pia, P-I-A, it's all capital letters, and I don't think I've ever actually seen it written out in Katakana. That's kind of represented here. We saw one way back up at the start of Isezaki Mall, but St. Tropez, or I think it's St. Tropez, Urban Entertainment Place. So a number of things in there you can see from the signage, Bowling Alley and Pachinko and Pachi Slot. There was the Namco Game Center not too far away. But I mentioned it in part six and we didn't take a look at it there. This was one at the end of one of the streets I really wish I had filmed. And we'll take a look off to the right. In game, there's a Gindako Highball Sakaba, part of a well-known chain over there and something that we've seen in the Like a Dragon series for quite a while. Maybe as far back, I believe, as Yakuza 5. I think that's when it really first started to show up. But here in real life and in game, you can see very, very minor differences, but it exists here for everybody to go check out and enjoy. You maybe won't get the absolute best takoyaki in your life going to Gindako, but you'll get a pretty solid serving of takoyaki. And this one, you can in-game, you can only walk up and hit up the guy in the window, but you can sit down inside if you really want to order something. And of course, since it's my favorite, I ended up getting the cheese in Mentaiko. The cheese wasn't melted <laughs> really as well as I would have liked, but still pretty tasty. Not a bad little thing to have as a quick snack or a light lunch as you're walking around here. I think I went to this McDonald's though. And there's quite a few in the area. There's one back up near Yamashita Park. There's one in the Kanai Station area as well. But McDonald's is popular in Japan. Don't let anybody, they tell you it's only there for the tourists. It's not true. They're very, very popular and they're very busy at lunchtime. Although the one thing they haven't really started to hop on board with yet, you can do mobile ordering. It's a bit of a rant, I know. So you can do mobile ordering, but there are no self-service kiosks for anything unless you go to specific locations. I think the one in Machida out of the Oda Q line exit that I usually take. Whoa, hi guy. That one you can you can do ordering kiosks, but since you can do mobile ordering and you can do that in English, it's an easy way to bypass the language barrier if you're concerned about that. We did take a look at one of these corners and streets in the extra video I put out after I released part six. I saw a little bit of this there, but it kind of fell outside of what we were looking at within that episode. And going in the wrong direction, it didn't really make sense on there. Plus it was an extra street where there wasn't a whole lot going on. But now we get to see some of the areas that were included there very briefly since it was falling under Isezaki Cho. And once we get past this street here, we'll go past this crosswalk, and then we'll finally be at the point where the in-game footage and the real-life footage starts to match back up again. As mentioned previously, we were covering about 750 meters here. It's about 1.4 kilometers, or I think about 0.85 miles total for where we started out at in the end of Isezaki Cho. And about half of that falls outside of what we see here in game. I didn't end up even going there on non-filming days. It just kind of, I don't think there was anything there to really make me go in that direction. And we won't take a look at it here because again, it does fall outside of what we see. There we go, there's our game footage again. We take a look over around here. We're not far from where the Hello Work would be, although there's no Gindako there since that was back up a little bit north from here. We already talked about Hello Work in part six and where that's at. Closer to Yokohama Stadium, since it is a real thing, but there's no building like that in this area. A little bit of red light district over there. There's a couple of music related monuments, I think a blues monument that I didn't really get a good look at. You can see a little bit off to the right. There's a music box there and then a monument off to the side. But the building here at the end, I couldn't find a name for it. And it's not something you can purchase in game as part of the business management simulator in Yakuza Like a Dragon. Here in real life, it's called Cross Street Isezaki. 
is a very small music venue. And it appears to be pretty much the exact same thing in game, judging by the posters on the windows, but you can't you can't utilize it in any way. We'll hop back up here. We're back up pretty close to where we started. And we're getting towards the end of this walk. And the end of the series, too. We have one last thing that does fall outside of what we see in-game. But I wanted to take a look at it as well, because it's a pretty major part of the area. And it's something that I briefly talked about in Part 3 in the extra episode about the trains in the area. It's, there's a couple entrances here in-game that point to an underground shopping street called Hamanard that are not used in any way. They're completely blocked off. Especially in Lost Judgment, there's like nothing you can do here. At least in Yakuza Like a Dragon, you can find a safe down here as well as one of the Hong Kong people that you can find hidden throughout Ijincho. Here in real life, this is the Marinard Shopping Arcade. The pronunciation of that, I am not entirely solid on. If you see the katakana reading, it's Marinado. And when you kind of look at it spelled out or maybe how it's supposed to be spelled, maybe it would be pronounced Marinade. But when you see that written in English, it's literally the exact same as marinade. I don't think that's correct. And when you look at the website for this shopping street, it does spell it as marinade. So that's pretty much what I'm going on. If I mispronounced it, I hope somebody will let me know down in the comments. But that's that's why I'm, I'm saying it that way. It does sound a little bit weird. But this is an entire area that stretches pretty much from the underground entrance of Kanai Station. We'll see some of the signage for that here in a moment and extends all the way over to the entrance of Isezaki Mall. This has been here since October 1977 and covers about 600 square meters underneath Shin Yokohama Dori, the big street above us, and can connect from the JR Kanai Station area via a couple of elevators, as I've mentioned back in part three in the extra video. And there's some staircases over there as well that'll lead down. You can see the signage here for the Kanai Station underground entrance as well as the JR Kanai Station entrance. We'll be heading over in that direction. If you see the hallway dead ahead of us, we'll jump back over there in just a second. It's mostly clothing stores down here as well as some places to eat. I think we passed a grocery store back there, but this is a good way to get out of the elements. It's also a much faster way to access Isezaki Mall, in my opinion, if you're coming out of Kanai Station. You can just head downstairs and bypass all of the extra streets above ground and all of the crosswalks and everything and just make your way directly over to where you want to go. And this is also the way to access the Yokohama Blue subway line since the underground gates for that, that doesn't connect to Japan Rail in any way. That's a different company running the Yokohama Blue line. It's not something I really ended up accessing a whole lot myself other than just to pass through. This is also a spot as well, if you were to take the stairs down from Kanai Station, there's a little bit of an area off to the side where uh, homeless people camp out at. I don't think they're allowed to do it, but it is better than them being out in the elements. They're not really bothering anybody either. It's just them trying to find a, a good place to stay for the night, have their stuff at. As we get closer to the subway lines, that is bringing our walk today to a close and also bringing AFC Presents Yokohama to a close. It's kind of crazy that I was thinking about it as I started the series and I thought, oh man, can I make it to seven episodes? But yeah, here we are. As we take a little bit of a look around here, we'll hop back up to above ground and take one last look down Isezaki Mall before we go into some final words as the series draws to a close. As the curtain falls on this series, I'd like to take, if I may, a moment to reflect on it personally. This is a project that probably for the last three or four years I've really wanted to make. Ever since I've done my other comparison videos, I knew the next time I got to Japan, I wanted to be able to use that time to be able to take on a real challenge. And of course, this was a pretty significant challenge. The map for Isezaki Ijin Cho so far, at least until maybe Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth comes out, has been the biggest and most involved the series has ever produced. I'm not sure if I have done the kind of job that I had in mind when I set out and started this project almost 12 months ago, from planning stages up to finishing the series now. But my biggest goal along the way was simply being able to do the best job I could, as well as finish the series and make sure I put something out there into the world that maybe it will have a positive impact on folks. Maybe 
it'll teach you something. If I could teach anybody with this series anything just about the city of Yokohama, maybe about the series, probably teaching people that aren't into the series so much more about it than anybody that actually plays it regularly like myself. If I can give somebody some kind of knowledge and give somebody some element of entertainment or even a smile on their face or a laugh, that would mean that I have succeeded in my goal, that I was able to put something positive out there in the world. And ultimately, I recommend anybody go out there and pay a visit to Yokohama. I only cover a very small portion of it in this series. There's lots to see and do out there, and it's an amazing, really wonderful place. So if you can make your way to Japan, don't miss out on it. Now, even though we're saying goodbye to Yokohama, this isn't the end of the AFC Presents series or the Like a Dragon comparison series. I do have another one in the works, although at this moment, as I'm recording this, I haven't quite started it yet. But we will be paying a visit to another location here pretty soon in 2024, so be on the lookout for that. Even though I've said it many times so far, I just want to take this final opportunity to thank you, the viewer, if you have seen just this video so far or if you've been here for the entire series thank you very much for watching thank you for your support anybody that's been commenting anybody that's been sharing stuff along the way i really really appreciate it and it's been a big motivating factor to see this series all the way through to the end so until we see each other again thank you very very much and we'll say goodbye one final time to the city of yokohama Thank you.